Hello, I'm Craig Dale, I'm the Head of Policy and Research at Commonweal, and in this presentation, Owning Our Energy, I'm going to talk about how Scotland can bring our energy sector into public ownership. This is a topic that Commonweal has campaigned on essentially since our inception. Some of our very earliest work dealt with the idea of publicly owning the energy sector. And our work over the past decade has helped frame the debate in Scotland. We've won support for this idea from multiple Scottish political parties, chiefly on the left, the SNP, the Greens and the Labour Party in Scotland. And as we'll see in a bit, some of our plan has actually been adopted, not in Scotland, but in Wales. The Welsh government is pushing forward with an idea of a publicly owned energy company. Even at a UK level, UK Labour's plan to create GB Energy was developed in a response to our campaign up here, so there is a common thread running through even that as well. You might be aware that the Scottish Government for several years did promote the idea of a publicly owned retail energy company. This was in response again to our campaign and to a call from SNP members at their conference. That plan, as we'll see, was incomplete and it failed and it has since been dropped by the party. Current plans in Scotland are now completely stonewalled. The, the idea is explicitly ruled out in the current draft energy strategy by the Scottish Government. In part one of this talk, I'm going to discuss the various options for public ownership because it's not just one monolithic model that we can think about here. There are various ways that we can look at to bring our energy sector into public ownership. A lot of the ideas in this talk build off our policy paper, Powering Am Our Ambitions, which you can read in Commonweal's Policy Library. On the larger scales, we see four government organisations all working together to make this happen. First is a public energy company or a network of public energy companies that will own and run energy generators in Scotland. This is everything from solar panels to wind turbines and other renewable energy methods. The second is a Scottish Energy Development Agency. They would be in charge of strategically planning the energy sector in Scotland. They'd be asking questions like where should the next wind turbine be built? Where is the demand for energy in Scotland and where is it going to be as Scottish demographics change? Which villages are best suited for the next district heating network? And other questions like that. Essentially, what is the next step in the Scottish energy development sector? This would be the Energy Development Agency's job to answer that question. The third organisation is a Scottish National Infrastructure Company. We've been quite bad at public procurement, particularly in Scotland, but in the UK in general. We have seen scandals like Carillion, we have seen scandals like PFI, and all of these come from just not being very good at managing procurement and relying very heavily on the private sector to do that. A Scottish National Infrastructure Company would bring all of that into the public sector as well. They would manage the procurement side, but they would also have a role in training staff and managing especially things like domestic manufacturing of renewable assets. The fourth organisation is the Scottish National Investment Bank. They would provide the backbone of the funding which would make all of this possible and would ensure that the returns on the investments into Scotland's public energy would flow back into itself and into the Scottish public purse. We would not see profits going overseas into the pockets of multinational shareholders or into tax havens. Now, all four of these organisations have been adopted to a greater or lesser degree by the SNP, by the Greens and by Scottish Labour. However, of the four, currently, as I'm giving this presentation, only the SNIB, only the investment bank currently exists, and it is very much too. Only the SNIB currently exists, and it is extremely limited in what it can do. It's also not really been built in the same vision as we had for it. So, onto the options. What could publicly owned energy look like in Scotland? Option one is the larger scale version. It is a single national energy company plus a network of community energy groups underneath it. Think Scottish Water. Think one company that manages all of the energy in Scotland. The difference between this and the plan that the SNP used to have until is that this wouldn't just be a company that delivers energy to company 
shops and consumers like a retail company like uh, you'll be used to paying your energy bills to, this would be a company that also owns generation capacity. The reason for this is that in the UK, the retail side of energy is actually really tightly regulated. The profit margins are not high and it's really rigged against smaller companies, which this would be starting out. You really need to be one of the so-called big six to, to ensure your uh, competitiveness in that market. And we have seen during the cost of living crisis and the energy crisis of, of the last couple of years, a lot of smaller energy companies go bust. It is very likely that a retail-only public energy company in Scotland would face a similar risk. It has to own its own generation so it can provide that electricity directly without having to buy it on the secondary market. And this is the model that the Welsh government has adopted. A national energy company in Wales would be providing its own generation capacity and bringing it to market. Now this is probably one of the hardest ones to do at the moment. Believe it or not, there's actually an explicit item in the Scotland Act that prevents the Scottish government from owning electricity. Um, the, the Scotland Act has a specific reservation on owning, generating, transmitting and storing electricity, which really kind of shows that this act that was created over a quarter of a century ago, before we were talking about this kind of way of doing energy in, in the UK, is out of date. It needs to be changed. It needs to be updated. It throws up all kinds of weird questions. For example, if the Scottish government puts a solar panel on the roof of one of its buildings, is that a breach of the Scotland Act? How about the batteries in the stationary cupboard? I'm being flippant, of course, but actually think about it. If the Scottish government is banned from owning storage, the storage capacity of electricity, does that include the batteries in the, sto in the, in the stationary cupboard? It's daft. It needs to be changed. It needs to be updated. These powers need to be delivered to Scotland so that we can start creating that kind of energy company. However, there is a loophole. Note that it only talks about electricity. Electricity is only one part of the greater part of energy. Heat is entirely devolved. It's not mentioned in this reservation. Anything that is not reserved is devolved. This means that instead of transmitting electricity to your home to power your heat pump, which then heats your home, the Scottish Government could deliver heat directly through a district heating network. So if the National Energy Company cannot do electricity at the moment, then maybe it could be a national heat company that delivers heat to your homes and does it cheaper than you can do it via electricity or any other method. Option two is a bit more decentralised. That, that reservation in the Scotland Act applies to the Scottish Government, but it does not apply to Scottish local authorities. Scottish local authorities can own electricity generators. And we know this because they have done it. A good example being the Aberdeen Renewable Energy Group, which is a company that is wholly owned by Aberdeen Council. It used to own offshore wind turbines until, to some degree of public scandal, it sold them off. It now focuses entirely on supporting businesses and co-investing and, and doing other projects like that. It doesn't own the generators itself anymore, but the fact that it did means that it could. We could have 32 local authority energy companies in Scotland. These could be supported and funded by the Scottish National Investment Bank or by other funding, whatever is appropriate. And if they do this, the profits from those, that electricity generation would mean that the system becomes rapidly self-sustaining. This would be best suited, as in the Welsh example, to onshore and regional scale developments. You, 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 you wouldn't normally expect South Lanarkshire Council to be building offshore wind turbines, considering it's a landlocked local authority. However... You could imagine all 32 or some group of those coalition, uh, of those local authorities coming together into some sort of coalition and bidding on larger scale projects. Is it possible that the Scotwind project of last year could have been could have saw investment from a, a consortium of 32 local authority energy companies? That's a question I'd like to see answered for the future. Option three is to go even more decentralized. This is community energy, and, and there are many examples of very successful community energy projects in Scotland at the moment. However, it is extremely difficult to set up community energy in Scotland. 
The funding landscape is extremely challenging. You never get enough from one source to be able to fund your project. You've got to go to multiple funding pots. And these small funding pots require almost a dedicated fundraiser to look at each one of them. The pots are often very complex to apply for. They often have a lot of strings attached. The process of applying is different for each one. And if you do somehow manage to pull together a pot of money to do a project... You then go back to do your next project and you find that half of the pots have disappeared, half of them are oversubscribed, and the process for uh, applying to them all is, is completely different again. It's very difficult to get the funding together. It's also very difficult for communities to build up the skills to run and manage these projects, especially if they've never done them before. And a lack of communication across Scotland means it's very difficult for communities to share those skills with others who want to do it. However, it is worth it. There are studies that have shown that Scottish community energy delivers 34 times more benefit to a local community than simply allowing a private company to put up, say, a wind turbine and contribute to a so-called community benefit scheme. Option four is kind of a hybrid model. This is the public-public partnership, not a public-private partnership. This is not PFI. This is a public-public partnership. This is where two different sectors, this is where two different parts of the public sector work together. This could be, for example, a national-scale national energy company helping to build community-owned wind turbines, using the skills of the NEC to construct them, using, using the heft that they have at scale to arrange the funding and then turning ownership over to the community to run them. This is particularly useful when financing the skills are tight because you can move these skills around but once scale is established the task is then to bring commercial developments that already exist into public ownership and these kind of public-public partnerships can provide the investment to do that. Again there are various examples around Scotland uh, one notable one would be the UK government and Scottish local authority city deals. Albeit they are not specific to energy and they are quite controversial and highly political at the moment. In some degrees, the, the city deals have been almost a way of the UK government pitting local authorities against each other, scrabbling for pots of money and pitting the local authorities against the Scottish government because constitutional politics is still alive in Scotland. But strip all that out and you do get a model of what this sort of thing could look like in a more collegiate and more positive partnership atmosphere. Option five is a slightly different one. This is the idea of a national mutual company different kind of public ownership. It's not controlled by any particular government or it's not controlled by any government organisation, local or national. A national mutual is a normal private company. It has shareholders. Those shareholders tell the company what to do. However, instead of buying shares in a national mutual, the shareholders are the consumers and the staff of the company. You don't go and buy shares and become a majority holder. You don't have billionaires coming in and sweeping up the company and reforging it according to their ego. You could have, if you wanted, a national mutual energy company in Scotland where every shareholder was every single adult living in Scotland. If you live in Scotland, you receive automatically one share in the company. You can't sell it. You can't transfer it to someone else. You only lose it if you leave the company. You only lose it if you leave the country. Or ownership could be based on the employees of the company and their consumers. This would be particularly useful if we're not ready to go full national scale with this company and it only has a, a smaller market share so far. But the idea is still the same. The consumers are the residents of Scotland tell this company what to do. You, with your one share, would have a vote at the AGM. We could imagine a system where... You have sliding scales. The, the company announces it has this much money uh, in surplus at the end of the year, and you get to decide what percentage of it goes to goes to shareholders as a dividend, i.e. how much do you get in a consumer energy rebate. 
You could decide what percentage of it is reinvested into the company so that it can grow and can take over even more market share or, or deliver new um, energy projects. Or you could decide how much of it is delivered to community projects. Particularly, again, useful if only the employees and the consumers are the shareholders. You can decide how much of the, the company's profits go to your community. This kind of mutual model of company ownership was once really common in banking, less so now, although they still exist. Less common again in the energy sector. However, there is a precedent in the UK. In Northern Ireland, the gas company Mutual Energy was established in 2003 on this model. So it can work, and it does work, in the UK right now. So this is another thing that Scotland could do. Of course, option six is simply to do nothing and just leave the energy sector in, the private, in private hands. We've seen over the last couple of years that the cost of living crisis is directly correlated with energy profits. Scotland is an extremely privatised economy, extremely privatised company, and our energy sector is an exemplar of that. Almost all of our energy is owned by foreign multinationals or even by foreign public energy companies. That's right, a good chunk of Scotland's energy sector is already in public ownership, just not Scottish public ownership. Especially the latter means that a portion of your energy bills are extracted as profits by these foreign public energy companies, sent back to their host countries, given to their host governments, because this is what happens when a public energy company makes a surplus, and in a way, your energy bills are helping to subsidise the public services of dozens of countries, just not Scotland. There's a good example of this happening in my village right now, where a proposed solar energy farm is, uh, is up for discussion. It's a massive project, about 100 megawatts of, of generating capacity, which is about 10 times the village's entire energy needs. It's owned by a company based in Liverpool that is itself a subsidiary of a Spanish energy firm. So the profits from that project are ultimately going to benefit Spain. The taxes from it are probably going to benefit the Spanish government, subsidise Spanish public services. This is still a, a, an open area of discussion in the community and we are start, and st just in the process of starting to organise to see what we can do about this. Do we outright oppose it or do we find a better way of making this so that it works for our community as well as the greater good? So, on to part two, funding public ownership. How do we make all of this happen? We have to consider the branching paths here. Both the Welsh and the UK Labour's GB energy schemes appear to be based on future ownership of energy. Who will own tomorrow's new onshore wind turbine, for example? Neither of them are really talking about taking existing private ownership of energy into public hands. They're not talking about nationalising existing capacity and claiming that existing profit extraction from the sector. So all of that could remain if all we do is talk about the future. There's also big questions, especially with GB Energy, about how big an impact is it going to be? It seems to be focused on co-investing rather than wholly owning future energy projects. And this means that there will be a part of those future energy projects that will presumably be part private owned as well. We don't know what the balance of the co-investment will be. Will it be 50-50? Will GBE have the lion's share of the project or will they have a token amount in there just to satisfy a political promise? Now, I'm not saying that in Scotland, 100% of the energy sector must be publicly owned. There will be people who advocate this. There is certainly a conversation to be had on that sliding scale between what is now you know, effectively 0% and that ultimate line of 100%. That conversation must include what happens to current ownership of energy particularly as Scotland already meets existing energy demands and we're a net exporter of energy. So future generation will be in that discussion about future domestic demand or what happens with Scotland's energy exports. So let's imagine we have a government that has decided it wants, for the sake of argument, 100% ownership of all energy in Scotland. 
how does it do it? The first option would be a free market buyout. Just simply buy every single share in every company that deals with the with energy in Scotland or just buy the assets straight off them at current market rate. This is probably the most expensive option. Jeremy Corbyn in 2015 proposed this for the UK and it was estimated it might cost about £300 billion to completely nationalise all energy in the UK. That's a huge amount of money, but in 2022, the profits from the UK energy sector were estimated at about £30 billion. And that was an exceptional year. I'm not saying we'll, we'll see that every single year. I hope not. The energy bills have been quite harsh. But at that kind of level, you could be talking about a £300 billion nationalisation plan paying back in 10, maybe 20 years. Or you don't need to nationalise everything all at once. You could stage this over years. You could have, for example, an annual profit tax or windfall tax that was invested in back into the sector by buying shares in the market and transferring those shares to a national energy company. Another option, slower still, is to realise that a lot of these energy companies get a lot of subsidy or other, other public funding from government. How about, instead of public sector how about instead of the government giving money to these energy companies, how about the government buys equity stakes in the projects instead? Now, to do this in Scotland, we're not entirely clear about how much it would cost. As I say, we only have the figures for a UK-scale nationalisation. And it's almost certain, though, that the Scottish plan would require far more capital borrowing powers than current devolution allows. We, we are limited to only a couple of billion pounds worth of capital investment, and things like the National Investment Bank are limited to only a few hundred million pounds a year worth of capital investment. So to do this within the current system is difficult to almost impossible. Even things like windfall taxes could be difficult under devolution. It's it's hard to see how the Scottish government could um, could apply those windfall taxes unilaterally as a devolved tax. Option two is quite similar to option one, but it's to recognise that companies needn't be nationalised at current market rates. You don't need to pay what the shareholders would pay if you're nationalising a company. It's perfectly legal to only pay a so-called fair price. What is a fair price? Well, the market rate might not price in the depreciation of older generators. If you build a wind turbine that has a 20-year lifespan and it's currently 18 years old, it's only got two years left on it, it's obviously not going to be worth as much as a brand new turbine. So the fair price may mark down asset the asset value of the nationalisation based on the age of the assets themselves. You can also consider that the excessive profits made by companies over the years are a negative to the public good, and that should be reflected in the price that you nationalise at. Similarly, if we look at the English private water sector, we see a sector that has been extracting profits for decades and has been under-investing to the point where the system is breaking down. If you were to nationalise all of the English water companies right now, the public sector would face a massive bill to bring those um those pipes and all the other infrastructure up to standard. So what you might do is say, right, if it's going to cost us £10 billion to uh, to bring your £20 billion asset up to standard, then we're only going to give you £10 billion for it. We are not going to pay for the cost of your underinvestment. A similar argument can be made in the energy sector where appropriate. And that discount can be applied to the fair price. I will say that this is... While everything is logical, while it's all sound and legal, I don't know if there are any numbers of what that fair price would be in Scotland's case. So we'll have to leave that for a further study. Option three, though, how to do it all for free. What if I told you that we could nationalise the Scottish energy sector without costing you, the energy user, a penny more than you'd pay if we don't nationalise it? There's a trick here. You see... When private companies install a new generator, a new wind turbine or whatever, they pass, sometimes more than, the cost of that that installation onto your energy bills. Part of your energy bills is to pay back the companies for their capital investments. Now, 
If a national energy company did the same thing, they would pass the cost on to you in the exact same way. So there's actually no real difference between a private company installing a wind turbine and passing the cost on to you, or the public sector building a wind turbine and passing the cost on to you. Now there's another aspect to this as well. You see, most of the land that is used for energy generation, think about onshore wind turbines for example, is not sold to companies, it's not owned by them, it's instead leased. And these leases have defined terms in their contracts. 10, 25, 40, 60 years, maybe even 99 year leases are common. Companies obviously advocate for as long as possible. They often advocate for perpetual leases, although these are less common. If they are time limited, when that lease comes to its end, instead of releasing it to the company, which is usually the common practice at the moment, that lease could be handed to the National Energy Company, along with the wind turbine still sitting on the land. The NEC can then run that wind turbine for its its remaining lifespan. Using the profits from that remaining lifespan, the NEC can reinvest and build a new turbine once it is ready for decommissioning, and then run that for its lifespan, and so on, and so on, perpetually. Doing this, over time, the entire national grid could be transferred to the public sector. There's a subtle point in here as well, though. That would obviously take a long time to do, especially if we're talking about 30, 40, 60 year leases. Waiting until the lease just hits its natural end isn't necessarily the fastest way to do it, and we don't really have time to do that given the climate emergencies on us. We also have to consider that sometimes these leases might be timed to the end of the useful lifespan of the generator. If you have a generator that has a 20-year lifespan and you have a 20-year lease, then by the time that lease comes to its end, the generator itself is also about to come to its end. So transferring the lease to the public sector at that point would be a very effective means of transferring the costs of decommissioning into the public sector without the public sector getting any of the profits to pay for it. However, contracts can be written with breakpoints that can be invoked if companies breach, for example, for performance or cost or environmental metrics. Have a think about how ScotRail was nationalised a couple of years early after Abelio failed its performance checks. So you could imagine a contract being written in a way that if the private sector didn't meet those performance targets, then the lease could be taken off them early and given to the National Energy Company. Another side of this as well is that a lot of these leases have specified maximum limits on how much generation can be, how much energy can be generated on. This is particularly common in the offshore, this is particularly common in the onshore wind sector where you might have a maximum limit of 5 megawatts per turbine. But technology has been moving on. Scotland has been building onshore wind now for more than 20 years. And a lot of those older wind turbines, the smaller ones that were used, using the technology of that time, are coming to their, their, their lifespan end and they're being replaced with new technology. So if you have a developer coming in and saying, well, we, these 5 megawatt turbines are at the end of the lifespan, we want to replace them with these new 10 megawatt turbines, that would exceed the lease, the limit on the lease, even if the lease still has years or decades to run. That requires the lease to be broken and a new one to be signed. This is itself a natural breakpoint where the lease could be transferred to the National Energy Company, presumably with them paying the previous company to build the turbine. Now, the Scottish Government is currently coordinating a plan of repowering Scotland's older onshore wind sites, but is explicitly refusing to consider transfers of ownership during this process. So, to sum up, Let's look at the steps that we need to take, we need to see, especially from the Scottish Government, to try and bring energy into Scottish public hands. First, we need a national energy company, by whichever method works, whatever option I I talked about in part one. I don't really... It might be a, a single monolithic entity, it might only focus on heat, it might be a coalition of multiple regional and local companies, but whatever method works, we have to do that now. 
when it comes to talking about energy leases, we need to make sure that they are as favourable to the public sector as possible. We can't be talking about 40, 60 year leases that take us well beyond the horizons of the climate emergency before we start talking about bringing these things into public ownership. We need short lease times, we need defined break clauses in the contracts, and we need a government willing to enforce those break clauses. We need to adopt a uh, a policy of no subsidy, only equity. Stop giving money to companies and to encourage them to invest. And that includes tax breaks, that includes things like our free ports, and starts talking about equity stakes in private projects and use them to bootstrap up the skills and capacity in our public energy sector. We need to supercharge the SNP, whether that's by campaigning for more powers from Westminster to do it or by any other method. We need to take that body that has a few hundred million pounds worth of investment power and turn it into several billion pounds worth of investment capacity so that it can start investing at scale and delivering those investments to the public sector. We need to start using that money through co-investments to bootstrap up the National Energy Company, build up the skills and the capacity for that company to take on bigger and more ambitious projects until it can move from supporting small local schemes to being the major player in Scotland's energy network. This is how every other country in Europe that has a national energy company, which is most of them, have done it. We also need to use the just transition policies that the Scottish Government supports to pull staff proactively from the fossil fuel sector into the renewable sector, give them the training and the support needed to be part of that transition. We have papers on this, Friends of the Earth and Platform also have papers on how this can happen. And we need more support to help communities own their own local generators. We need more funding. We need more skills. We need a simplified system of making this happen. And we need more support to help communities campaign in their own right so that when proposals come forward, like the one I mentioned earlier, they can make sure that those proposals benefit the community as as can be as beneficial to the community as possible and not just be a means of turning a rural village into a power station for profit extraction. So thank you all for listening to this. Commonweal is entirely funded by our donors and supporters. So if you like this talk, if you like our policies, please go to the donate page on our website and help help us to produce even more. If you want to learn more, you can download all of our policy papers for free. You can also buy books and other Commonweal merchandise in our shop. Thank you. I've been Craig Dale for Commonweal.